The current healthcare system isn't about health, wellness, and longevity. It's crisis intervention and revenue generation. Lee and I came together with this passion for better nutrition, proper exercise, the importance of sleep and community yeah. engagement. Welcome to the Crisco and Company podcast. My name is Dr. Lee Crisco. I'm a practicing diagnostic radiologist. I've also worked as a family doctor, ER doctor, and have training in anti-aging medicine and neuroradiology. A few years ago, I learned about the power of nutrition and its relationship to health. This radically changed my perspective on the healthcare system that I've worked in for so many decades. And I came to realize that much of what I do as a radiologist is to diagnose the consequences of bad food choices. This has led me and my wife, Joyce, to start the Crisco & Company um, website uh, where we advocate aspirational aging. Aspirational aging is aging while staying lean, fit, and healthy, while staying fully engaged in life for as long as possible. We advocate a whole food plant-based diet, minimizing or better yet eliminating processed food and animal products. We advocate building up the body with exercise and building the mind with lifelong learning. We are about quality sleep and eliminating and mitigating harmful stress. And lastly, we advocate nurturing healthy relationships and engagement in community. I'm very excited and pleased to introduce our guest today, Dr. Neil Barnard. Dr. Barnard is an adjunct professor of medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, DC, and is president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He has led numerous research studies investigating the effects of diet on diabetes, body weight, and chronic pain funded by the National Institutes of Health. He is paving the way to view type two diabetes as a potentially reversible condition for many patients. He has authored over 100 publications and 20 books for both medical and lay readers. He is an icon in the plant-based movement, and we feel honored that he is here with us today. He has been of great personal help to me when early in my plant-based journey, I read Dr. Dr. Barnard's program for reversing diabetes, which was instrumental in convincing me to adhere to a plant-based diet, and my prediabetes was re resolved literally within a few days. Welcome, Dr. Barnard, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, hi, Lee. It's great to be with you today. Yeah. Now, um, in my personal life as a doc diagnostic radiologist in the, in the present healthcare system, become, I become more and more overwhelmed as we get busier and busier every year, with, and yet I develop a sense of futility because it's not that uncommon for me to see four or five or even six nutritionally related diseases on a single CT scan, such as gallstones, fatty liver, kidney disease, and diverticular disease. And yet I know that the root cause of these problems are not being meaningfully addressed by the medical profession. We see ever increasing utilization of high tech testing with really no evidence that this produces greater health. And we spend more and more money on pills and surgeries and testing. The U.S. spends 20% of GDP on healthcare. Per person, the U.S. spends 50% more than the next most expensive nation. And yet we are the 46th in the world for life expectancy. For that expense, you'd think that we would be living the longest of anyone on earth. And yet we seem to be getting sicker and fatter and life expectancies are dropping a little bit. Dr. Barnard, do you have any thoughts on these trends? Is the answer right. to these problems to just order more tests and surgeries and pills? Well, it could be a little bit dispiriting, um, but what you said is exactly uh, the truth. And it's something that we do have to address. Uh, when a person comes in to your office, whatever kind of physician you may be, mm -hmm. whether they're coming in for a test or a procedure or psychotherapy or whatever it is, they come in, they may be overweight, they may have diabetes, they may have hypertension, but that diabetes was not caused by a deficiency of metformin and their hypertension wasn't caused by a deficiency of lisinopril and their high cholesterol wasn't caused by some magical deficiency of a statin drug. These are all driven by food, food choices. And that's been a little bit of a switch because medicine as medical practice has, we've sort of treated our professions as if we we're kind of band-aid manufacturers mm -hmm. so that we know how to, how to apply our band-aid, but we don't really think about what caused that injury in the first place. And it's been a little bit of a, um, I guess a journey of discovery in the world of research to figure out what's really causing diabetes, what's really causing these things. But we've had the answer now and the answer in many cases is what's on our plate. 
Not always true. Trauma, childbirth, there are things in medicine that don't really have anything to do with what you had for breakfast. But on the other hand, there are so many things that do. The beauty of it is once we discover that and learn how to use food in a, a little bit more healing way, it's not only empowering for the patient, and as you described, with your experience with prediabetes going away amazingly rapidly, so many people experience that. And for the doctors who have found that they can incorporate this into their practice, suddenly your practice becomes so enriched and you're providing something that is so much more powerful and that, frankly, your patients like a whole lot better than the, the pills we were doling out before. There's always a role for medications and for other aspects of, of our medical armamentarium. But uh, when we tackle the cause of disease, that gives us much more power. Yeah, one thing that's changed with my practice in the last few years is from time to time, I'll talk to patients about different test results. And you know, very frequently, they're in their current predicament because of what they have ate. And uh, when appropriate, I'll actually have a conversation with them about that. And I'm sure I'm probably one of the very few radiologists in the whole country that actually does that. But when someone goes to the Barnard Medical Center, are they already sort of predisposed towards the idea of plant-based nutrition? Or is that something that you uh, teach them about when they get there? How does it work in your clinic? It, the complaint I hear from a lot of production physicians is that they just really don't have time. How, how do you make it work at the Barnard Medical Center? Okay, well, the first thing is uh, some people come and seek us out because they're looking for a food solution, but I would say the majority aren't. Uh, we're just in their insurance plan or they're coming in to see us with a urinary infection or a twisted ankle or as is very often the case, they've got diabetes and weight problems and all kinds of other things. Um, so we're like any other clinic in that we are able to use medications and procedures and diagnostic tests just like everybody else, but we always want to address the cause of the cause of the problem. We want to cure that patient and make that problem go away. Uh, we don't want them to necessarily be our patients forever where we're uh, gradually increasing their insulin dosage and that kind of thing. If we can cure the problem, let's do it. If the problem is their food, uh, let's let's change that. But now you ask a really important question. Um, and that is in medical practice where patients come in, you see a new patient every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever the case may be, um, doctors will complain they don't have enough time. And I would say a couple of things. One is, I hope doctors can get more command over their schedule than that. If you need a little more time with a patient, by all means, take it. Um, but the second thing is, the doctor does not have to be the nutrition teacher. If a patient comes in with type 2 diabetes, in our clinic, to tell you the honest truth, the doctor does need to size up the patient's status. They need to look at their diagnostics and see what condition they're in. But the diet teaching by the doctor can take all of two minutes. By that, I mean, what the doctor is doing is explaining the role of nutrition uh, in causing the diabetes. In our case, that means something that the patient has never heard of before, which is that their cells, their muscle cells, their liver cells have filled up with fat particles. And the patient at that point says, what do you mean I got fat particles building up in my cells? And the doctor explains that from the foods they're eating, cheese and ham and greasy french fries or whatever, the fat particles have filled up in their cells. And once that happens, insulin can't work anymore. You're insulin resistant and your blood sugar builds up because the fat particles make your insulin not work. The patient understands that the doctor is done. At that point, your team takes in. In the same way as the quarterback hands the ball to the, the halfback or sends it down the field, um, the patient walks out of the exam room. The registered dietitian will sit down with the patient and the patient's reluctant spouse and start some nutrition planning. And they might take 45 minutes or an hour and they'll go through what you're having for breakfast now and how we can make that a little healthier. And the patient says, okay, I can do this. And then we have we have a certain uh, series that that we that we go through every time. I've never seen anybody unable to do it. it. Makes it so easy to cure your diabetes. If I could be so bold, here's what you do: the dietitian says, or, or a doctor can do this if they want to, but we usually use dietetic professionals. The dietitian says, um, "What do you have for breakfast? What do you have for lunch? What do you have for dinner?" They walk through it and they say, "How can we make each one of these totally plant based?" You're, you're going to be a vegan right now. But what we're going to do is we're going to proceed that with a week of just trying out different choices. 
Um, you're not changing your diet, but you're trying different possibilities. Okay, um, let's see. Oatmeal's okay, but I always have cream on top. Uh, I guess I could have soy milk or oat milk or rice milk or almond milk, but I never tried them. You got a week, try them. Um, my sister keeps telling me that that morning star veggie sausage is good, but I never tried it. Okay, if that calls to you, try it. You got a week. So they take the next seven days and they write down all their ideas for plant-based foods that they genuinely like and want to eat. So if they eat at an Italian restaurant, they've got the uh, spicy arrabbiata sauce, uh, which happens to be plant-based. Um, or if they're eating at a Latin American restaurant, they've got veggie fajitas and bean burritos. Or if the sushi bar is their thing, they're looking for the plant-based cucumber roll, asparagus roll, whatever. They come back a week later. They got a million choices. They say, these are foods that are vegan and I love them. So now we're going to begin. For the next 21 days, no animal products at all. Patient says, I can do anything for 21 days. But the beauty of this is they've already got their list. They know what they want to eat. It's the easiest thing possible. And after 21 days, they feel better physically. They are losing weight. Their blood sugar numbers have changed dramatically. If they're on medicine, they've already reduced their doses. And the second thing is because they have had no meat. They haven't had chicken wings for 21 days. Amazingly enough, they have lost their taste for all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And they've discovered new tastes, new recipes, new websites, new books, uh, new films, they, they, they get really excited and they say, I want to just keep this journey going for a little while. You never confront skepticism. People are allowed to be skeptical. They should be skeptical, frankly, because uh, there's a lot of goofy diets out there. Um, and you never leave your short-term focus. They are always free to go back to the way they were eating before if they want. And the patients love it, appreciate it, benefit from it. And they get so excited that they tell all their friends about how great they're feeling. And in turn, their friends say, you look great, you know? So anyway, that's, that's what we do. What we do our, and our doctors just love it. And it's, it's the way, it's the, really the way to work. Yeah. Well, I mean, as a radiologist myself, like I say, I do talk to people fairly frequently about diet, not just, you know, patients from time to time when appropriate, but, you know, friends and family. And I've noticed that there's a huge range in the way people respond to what you're saying. Um, when I met Joyce a while ago, I mean, she couldn't start it fast enough when I told her about the virtues of a plant-based diet. And she went on the diet. She didn't really have any weight to lose, but she lost about eight or 10 pounds completely effortlessly, eating as much as she needed. She had some aches and pains that just kind of evaporated. And my experience was, although I wasn't really trying to lose weight, I did lose about 16 pounds of fat, like completely effortlessly. Um, my prediabetes went away. I dropped my cholesterol 187 points. And I noticed that my exercise capacity just like skyrocketed. Um, and about this time last year, just for the heck of it, I did an online biking program and I wanted to see if I could go 100 miles. And I did 102 miles in six hours. I attribute that to the diet. Um, you know, I was training for it, uh, but not training that much. And there's no way I could have done that on a conventional diet. Um, but I do find it interesting that, uh, you know, some people just run with it with a five minute conversation. They're just running with it. And then some people, I've even had people get very angry with me. They just somehow feel it as a personal affront that you mentioned, <laughs> mentioned that, you know, there's benefit in changing the diet. How does the plant-based diet stand up against things like keto or paleo for management of weight and uh, diabetes? Okay. Well, by the way, let, let me just touch on something that you mentioned earlier is that people have questions or, or they hit a roadblock or they have an objection. I think that's normal. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important to be available to the patient to answer questions. Or that's why people like me write books. Because uh, when we do research studies, for example, uh, we just finished a study on menopausal symptoms for women with really bad hot flashes. And the, the prescription um, was vegan diet, no animal products keep oils really low and add a half a cup of cooked soybeans um, because their isoflavones not only reduce cancer risk, but also help knock out hot flashes. Anyway, the reduction in hot flashes was about 88%, 88% uh, reduction in the moderate to severe hot flashes. So it's, wow. it's like it's like medicine, it's huge. It's, it's as powerful as HRT with, with none of the bad side effects. However, uh, when you prescribe something like this, it's new. 
And so people will have questions. Um, and the same question is if you pick up a prescription at the store, you may have a question about how to use it or something like that. And people have that with nutrition. Uh, next week, I've got to go to a wedding and there won't be healthy foods or what do I eat? Um, you, you, we have to be available to answer those questions. The answers are easy, but they may not occur to a patient. So that's the way it is. But with regard to uh, other kinds of diets, uh, ketogenic diets do cause weight loss, and that's because they avoid carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is in vegetables, starchy vegetables, beans, pasta, rice, other grains, breads, fruits, and that's 55, 60% of what you eat. If you remove more than half of what you eat, you're going to lose weight. Mm -hmm. But what's and and people do lose weight and they get all excited, but what's left behind are the foods that are filled with fat and cholesterol. So over time, their insulin resistance is not getting better. Their cancer risk is not getting better. And sometimes these people have really bad cardiovascular risks as a result. So so we, we always encourage people to go to a healthier diet and it's a plant-based diet. Yeah, when I was doing more of a you know a low carb paleo type of diet, my cholesterol actually went up to three hundred and thirty, yeah. which was crazy high, um, and that was in the backdrop of having you know a congenitally elevated lipoprotein A, which is a setup for heart disease. Um, the lipoprotein A has not changed much, which is sort of expected, but I've mitigated all of the background things like the the pre diabetes and the high cholesterol, so I feel like I'm in a much safer position now eating whole food plant-based diet. Now, now you, what about oils? Isn't olive oil help, healthy? We hear so much about olive oil. Better than butter, um, that's for sure. Um, so, and, and when people uh, start using plant oils instead of animal-based fats, generally speaking, their diet is better than it was before. However, there's a couple of things. Um, with regard to weight loss, fats and oils are all pretty much the same. Every gram of lard, has nine calories. Every gram of olive oil has nine calories too. So it's a better quality of fat, but you don't lose any weight on that kind of program. Um, the other thing is that what makes, one of the things that makes olive oil better than butter um, is it's lower in saturated fat, the kind that raises cholesterol, but it's not zero. Um, so if you have say beef fat, it's about 50% saturated fat, chicken fat, maybe 30% saturated fat. For olive oil, it's about 14%. But if I'm not using oil at all, it's it's 0%. So mm -hmm. um, we show people how to uh, cook without adding oils. There are still natural traces of oils in beans and vegetables. It's not much, but it's a little bit. Um, and uh, when people get the oily foods out of their diet, what they discover is their weight loss is really accelerated. Now, what about uh, nuts? Is the, do you have an issue with people consuming nuts because there is some, you know, fair bit of fat in nuts? Yeah, there is a lot of fat in nuts. Um, same story. Um, the fat in nuts is just as fattening as chicken fat or beef fat or, or lard. It's a much better quality of fat. And so, uh, let me say two different things. One is that nuts are very fatty. Um, if you eat a lot of them, you, it, it, if you're trying to lose weight and peanut butter is your big thing, it's going to interfere with your weight loss, just like guacamole or oil. Those are healthier types of foods than animal products, but they're still really calorie dense. On the other hand, um, nuts happen to be a really rich source of vitamin E. And vitamin E, for example, reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So what do I do? Um, what I would say is if you are trying to lose weight or tackle symptoms like uh, insulin resistance, diabetes, and so forth. I'd keep the nuts kind of few and far between. Uh, but on the other hand, if you are a healthy, skinny person and you're, you know, things are generally going well for you, about an ounce of nuts per day gives you a pretty good dose of vitamin E. That's just a, a small handful. And uh, almonds or walnuts, uh, it, it's hard to argue. Uh, they, they do seem to have a health benefit. Yeah, I mean, I include a small amount of nuts in my my uh, diet daily uh, because I have a fairly high calorie need. I just help it find it sort of helps fill me up a little bit. Um, now, I understand that you take umbrage with the consumption of dairy. What's what's the problem with dairy? Well, there, I mean, there's several problems with dairy. Um, dairy's biological role was to help a calf to get big enough to gra to to graze on his own or her own. And we kind of forgot that um, human culture, what, 10 or 12,000 years ago, discovered that if you make a cow stand still and you impregnate her, you will 
you'll get some uh, milk out of her nine months later. As time has gone on, that business has thrived and it's and ingratiated itself with the U.S. government and other government governmental bodies that recommend dairy, and they recommend it as a source of calcium. There's a couple things wrong with that. The, the first thing is the cow doesn't make calcium. The cow just eats calcium in 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 greens. So if the cow was eating grass, the calcium in the soil came to the to the animal in the grass. Now, hopefully, you're not eating grass, but all green vegetables have a fair amount of calcium in them. They vary in absorption, but in some, it's much higher than in milk. The second thing, and more important thing, is that milk's number one nutrient is not calcium. It's sugar, mm -hmm. lactose sugar that the cow made. Number two is fat. And it's not healthy fat. It's mostly saturated fat. Um, so there is zero biological requirement for lactose sugar or saturated fat in your diet at all. And dairy products deliver those, especially something like cheese, which as addicting as it is, it doesn't love you back. So mm -hmm. um, we're encouraging people to, to get away from dairy products. Now, whenever I talk to people about, you know, adopting a plant-based diet, they often say, well, I could maybe give up meat, but I just can't fathom the idea of giving up cheese. Is there any biological basis to that? Yeah, there's a huge one. Um, the cheese protein is casein. The casein is the main protein in all dairy products, but it's concentrated in cheese. And in your digestive tract, it breaks apart to release what are called casomorphins, which are small opiates that are coated into the dairy protein. And they go to the to your brain and attach to what are called mu receptors, uh, and they lead to a slight narcotic effect. Um, I know this is bizarre for people to hear, but researchers have been studying this for a very long period of time. That what they believe is that this is sort of the, a physiological basis for the mother-infant bond. The mama cow nourishes her baby, gives the baby a big chunk of sugar and fat to help the calf grow fat and big, um, and a little bit of feel good in the form of casomorphins that calm the, the infant down. When you turn milk into cheese, those feel good chemicals are concentrated. And so along with all the cholesterol and fat and sodium in the in the cheese that are going to threaten your health, you're going to get some casomorphins that make you decide you don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, I was listening to you on the Rich Roll podcast, and you mentioned that there's some perverse relationship between the U.S. government and the uh, dairy industry to promote cheese, despite the fact that it's actually very unhealthy. Can you elaborate on that? There are... There, there have for years been many, many uh, agreements between the U.S. government and the dairy industry, um, which I can show you on paper. And, and the government is forced to do this by federal law. Uh, years ago, Congress passed laws saying that, that uh, the federal government must promote American agricultural products, irrespective of their health risks. And so dairy has cashed in on this in a big way. And so uh, McDonald's, Burger King, um, many of the, the fast food chains signed agreements with the, with the US government that they would promote dairy products in their menu offerings and particularly cheese. And so you would see uh, a burger or a burrito that didn't have a whole lot of cheese on it, but suddenly the cheese is increased and it's part of the advertisements. And it's been hugely effective. Um, over the time that the USDA has tracked American cheese consumption, uh, it started in 1909 when the average American ate less than four pounds of cheese per year. It was actually 3.8. Um, as of 2017, we were up to almost 37 pounds of cheese consumed by every American just on average every year. That's, wow. that, that's about 70,000 calories mm -hmm. that are totally unnecessary just there to top your burger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's one other thing. That, or there's one other thing, though. I do want to mention about cheese and dairy in general, and that's the links with cancer. Mm -hmm. This has been a big surprise, um, but because milk comes out of a cow, she's making estrogen, estrogens, particularly estradiol, uh, which is a female sex hormone. And because she's impregnated by the farmers uh, every uh, year, and and is milked during much of her pregnancy. Uh, she's creating a lot of estradiol that gets into milk products. That's linked to breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, when you consume milk, something in the blood increases called IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor. This won't be on the test, but the point is 
that that is linked to prostate cancer. So these have been cropping up in observational studies where you look at good grief. Milk drinking men have a lot more prostate cancer than men who don't have, have cow's milk at all. Uh, women who drink uh, milk in the Adventist Health Study too, for example, they had substantially more breast cancer risk than women who avoided it. And we now know the smoking gun. We, we know what it is in dairy that causes your cancer cells to grow in the same way as it causes the calf to grow. So um, bottom line, this whole dairy promotion that you grew up with, I imagine, and I did, has really been a huge mistake. And we should have left the milk to the cow. Yes. I mean, prostate cancer and breast cancer are just so common, common everyday diagnoses in the practice of medicine and radiology. I mean, I find it very motivating to not consume dairy knowing that there's a link there. Um, and, uh, you know, prostate cancer, uh, it kills some men. Uh, a lot of men get prostatectomies, tremendous morbidity from prostatectomies. You know, often men are incontinent and also impotent. Um, it's a disease I just don't want to have. So I find that motivating to stay away from dairy. And as you mentioned, as time goes on, uh, you don't even really miss it. One thing that I tell people, and I'm encouraging to consider this approach to you know, eating, is that when you look at other dietary approaches like counting calories or, counting, or limiting carbohydrates, as time goes on, it gets harder and harder and harder. But when you go on a whole food plant-based diet, as time goes on, it just gets easier and easier and easier. And bizarre as it may sound, I look forward to having a bowl of steamed kale. Used to, I used to have to sort of, sort of hold my nose, but as time went on, I acquired a taste for it and I really enjoy these foods. People will often say, you know, the food is so bland, this is not appetizing. Um, and I went through the same experience myself. You know, there was an adjustment period, um, but then as time goes on, the food tastes better and better. And then that's what you actually crave. And then on those occasions, when you go off for a restaurant meal, they, they taste too salty, too greasy, too slimy. And you just want to get back to your simple vegan meals. Can you tell us about that adaptation process? Yeah, no, everybody's a little bit different. Now, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. And my diet growing up was, I got to tell you, every day, every night at dinner, it was roast beef, baked potatoes, and corn. Mm -hmm. uh, except for special occasions when it was roast beef, baked potatoes, and peas. Mm -hmm. And that's what we ate. And I've now lived in Washington, D.C. since I went to medical sco school here at George Washington University. And outside my office, there's an Italian restaurant where I can go and have angel hair pasta uh, covered with a beautiful arrabbiata sauce or a marinara sauce with grilled asparagus on the side or, or steamed spinach or something like that, a nice salad. Um, they'll offer you a glass of red wine if you want it. Uh, next door is a sushi bar where you can have an asparagus roll, a sweet potato roll, a cucumber roll. Across the street, there is an Indian restaurant where they have just jewels made from lentils, spinach, chickpeas, all these wonderful curry dishes, um, which, you know, you, I mean, they're just part of their routine. Um, so there, there's one after another. And even back in Fargo, when I go there on Main Street, there's a restaurant called the Mexican Village. They will give you a bean burrito, a jalapeno burrito, filled with jalapenos and refried beans, covered with a delicious sauce. And if you hold the cheese, that's vegan too. Mm -hmm. So if you said to me, Neil, you can't have those wonderful Italian foods or Indian foods or Hunan, Sichuan, Chinese foods. You got to go back to your Fargo, North Dakota, roast beef, baked potatoes, and corn. Mm -hmm. Which diet is restrictive here? I'm going to tell you, I eat I eat foods that I much prefer. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't eat the animal products, even if somebody told me that they thought they were healthier. You just don't need that kind of stuff and you don't want it. Mm -hmm. um, so. Well, I've heard uh, estimates ranging between 80,000 and 300,000 edible plant foods. So the variety is actually unlimited. The knee-jerk response is often, well, if you don't eat processed food and if you don't eat animals, what's left to eat? Well, the truth is there's a tremendous amount of variety in what you get to eat. Um, and uh, there's like limitless recipes available in books and online. I mean, you can never get through them all. Um, but Lee, it's an, it's an exploration. I think just what you said is exactly right. The people go online, they pick up a book and they think, wow. This is amazing. And you go to the store and, you know, it used to be the dairy case was dairy. Mm -hmm. Now you look there and it's 
was soy milk, then rice milk, then hemp milk, then oat milk, then almond milk, all the different varieties. And you could pick up three or four different ones and say, this is the one that really is, is so tasty. And you start looking around all the different options that there are for you. Eating becomes exciting again, as opposed to the idea of taking a hunk of meat. And I was traveling in Paris a few years ago. And there are, I think it's nine or 10, three star, three Michelin star restaurants in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and at one of these, which is called L'Arpege, as in Arpeggio, the, the chef said, came out and he just said, I have lost interest in a big hunk of pork or a hunk of steak coming in here. And I got to cut it up and try to make something out of that. that that's not artistry. And he fell in love with the beautiful artistry of different vegetables and fruits and beans and things that you could make from them and started having farms, his own farms, bring in these organic foods into his restaurant. So my point is the most high end artistic foods at the very best places to eat on the planet are now discovering that if you get away from that hunk of flesh um, and you start using the beautiful foods that, uh, that the earth has provided, um, eating becomes re really an exciting journey. And you're going to have some experiments that didn't work out so hot. You're going to have some others that just change your life. So uh, it, it's, it's a fun experiment. But along the way, you shed 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. Your um, exercise, your energy. I have the same experience as you have that um, I'm faster now when I run than I than I was when I was a teenager. Oh. Um, and you know, you just want you just want to uh, you just want to feel good. You want to be healthy. You don't want to be on medicines and hanging out at the CVS. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, you get to the point where you're. I find I'm just so hooked on it. Like nobody's taking my plant based diet away from me. I mean, I just mm -hmm. I don't want to go back to uh, being that way. But, you know, it's interesting, you mentioned North Dakota. I go to North Dakota from time to time uh, for, for work, uh, to work in a small hospital in Minnesota near the, uh, the border with North Dakota. And you realize the world has changed when you can fly to Grand Forks, North Dakota, and you need it's time for lunch. And uh, you, they're advertising, you know, plant-based pita sandwiches. I mean, I think yeah. the world is changing in a, in a favorable way that way. Oh, but my, Lee, you, you said it. You know, it's funny. I could go to Fargo, visit my family there. You can go to any grocery store and I'm telling you, they're, they've got tofu stocked up. They're ready for you to put it in your fry pan and scramble it up. And they've got veggie hot dogs and veggie burgers because not only do the young people want it, not only do the doctors want it, but people in general want to explore new things. They've seen these things, they've heard about them. They want to try them and they want to see, okay, there's four different veggie sausages. Which one is the one that I like the best? Mm -hmm. But the other thing is they've seen what you've seen is people have seen family members diagnosed with cancer, diagnosed with heart disease, um, unfortunately having to go to their celestial reward when they're 60, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to being able to see their grandkids grow up. Mm -hmm. People want to be healthy. They want to feel good. They don't want to be carrying that extra 35 pounds of weight. If they can get rid of all that stuff, we're not going to live forever, but let's, let's feel good while we're at it. So I, yeah. I think everybody appreciates that. It is funny. You should say that just late yesterday afternoon, I was at work and uh, chatting with the technologists and they asked me how old I was. So, well, I'm going to be 64 in, in March. And they're there, well, 64. Or, um, and they see that I'm, you know, fit and healthy. And they're, what do you think when you see all these patients that you're working on, they're your age and they can't even move. And it's an unfortunate thing because this crosses my mind several times a day. I see these debilitated patients, sometimes with awful catastrophic consequences to their diet. And I'm thinking it just didn't have to be that way. Um, you know, this, the stuff I see, you know, diverticular disease with colocutaneous ab, uh, fistulae and colovesical fistula, where they've got feces coming out in their urine and feces coming out of their skin and all kinds of horrible consequences. And I'm thinking to myself, if they had eaten a plant-based diet, this would have never happened. Like, what was the impetus for you to get interested in this? What what happened in your life that changed your path down a plant-based path? Yeah, I, I got to tell you, I kind of did all the wrong things first. Um, <laughs> you know, growing up in Fargo, um, I mean, I drove cattle to slaughter with my uncle. Um, I had a twenty-gauge shotgun. Uh, that my my dad and my brothers and I would go and shoot the ducks out of the sky, and you know, my mother would clean them and eat. I mean, we ate all kinds of stuff that I wouldn't eat now, and I I regret, I have to say. But um, 
the year before I went to medical school, I was working in Minneapolis at Fairview Hospital. And I was um, the, the autopsy assistant, or I think my job title was morgue attendant. When somebody would die in the hospital, they'd end up in my cooler. And um, the pathologist would come down and I'd pull the body out of the cooler and put him on the slab. And the pathologist would do the autopsy to determine the cause of death. And they knew that I was gonna be go going to medical school the next year. So I would get these um, lectures over the autopsy about what we were seeing. And, and it was very instructive to me. One day we had a man die in the hospital of a massive heart attack, probably from eating hospital food, but that's another, another story. So anyway, um, the pathologist uh, took a big chunk of ribs off the front of the chest <laughs> and he put the ribs down on the table and that exposes the heart. And he said, look at the coronary arteries. And I'll never forget his lecture. They're called coronary because they crown the heart, Neil. Look here. And you know, I had gloves on. So he said, like, feel, feel this artery. He sliced it open. And instead of it feeling like a kind of a rubbery little artery, it felt crunchy. Um, it was calcified. It was like a, a sort of like a pipe stem in a way. And that amazed me. And I said, what is this? He says, bacon and eggs, Neil, bacon and eggs. And so um, I said, what do you mean? He said, well, when people eat animal products, the cholesterol causes these problems. And the saturated fat, of course, causes your cholesterol to rise higher. Anyway, uh, at the end of the examination, he had found this same artery narrowing process in the arteries to the heart, the arteries to the brain. You know, your, your carotid arteries will get narrowings too, setting you up for a stroke. Uh, the arteries to the kidneys. And he says, this is systemic atherosclerosis. So, okay, let's write this down. Um, he left the room. He'd finished his work. He was done. I had to clean up. So I put the organs back in the body and I took the, the ribs that he had cut out and I, I put them, I tried to make them fit with the other ribs and I sewed the skin up and cleaned everything up. And then it was mid-afternoon by that point. So I went up to the cafeteria and I said, do you have anything left to eat? He had a plate of ribs. I want to tell you, <laughs> I looked at it and I, I could smell it and it was this was a dead body I mean it smelled like a body it looked like a body and I said I, I just couldn't eat it and I didn't become a vegetarian right away but this played on my mind and I started to think I started to kind of put two and two together and then I shortly after that I moved to Washington here to go to medical school and I start eventually I thought that's enough mm -hmm. um I remembered my first job at, at, at McDonald's uh, in Fargo on University Drive, uh, serving up bad foods. And I thought, I I'm done. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, the bigger picture hits you too. Um, you can't be impervious to hearing about climate change mm -hmm. and how animal agriculture is a humongous contributor. And then also, you start to think even about the animals themselves, as I certainly did. Um, the cows who were loaded into the trucks and the ducks I shot out of the sky. And I thought, you know, Let's leave them in peace too. Um, so all of these things become helpful motivators. And eventually I went vegetarian and then just threw the animal products out altogether mm -hmm. and, and never looked back. Yeah, sometimes it make, takes a while to sort of make these connections and to come to these conclusions. I remember reading way back in the 80s, uh, Dr. Or John Robbins' book, Diet for New America. And it, it made an impact on me and uh, for a while, um, uh, cut back on the animal products a lot, but then became sort of seduced or indoctrinated by this cultural programming that you need all this protein and then slip back into a more conventional diet. Sometimes it takes a while to sort of make all these connections and realize that a whole food plant-based vegan diet really is the way to go. And um, it is a major sort of source of cognitive dissonance to say that on one hand, you can pet the family dog and on the other hand, you have a pork chop in your hand. And that pig that the pork chop came from was probably smarter than the dog and potentially even as smart as a three-year-old child. And you realize that there's some um, uh, moral problems with eating meat as well. But I, I found that what happened with me is I came to realize that there were health benefits to uh, eating a plant-based diet. Then it sort of opens your eyes a little bit. You're more open to these other ideas about you know humane treatment of anim animals and so on. Well, I found, I found that very useful, I have to say, because let's say I've got, I mean, we're known for our diabetes research. Mm -hmm. um, and starting in 2003, NIH funded us to 
test to try, try to come up with better diets for diabetes. And they're, they're diets that didn't have animal products in them at all. And for the reason I mentioned at the top of our broadcast, um, mm -hmm. we want to get the fat out of the muscle cells and you got to get the animal products out if you want to do that. In the course of this work, we discovered that when people have diabetes and it goes away or it improves dramatically, they are motivated. They want to continue this diet, but they live in a family. Mm -hmm. And so their 16 year old son says, I'm never going to get diabetes. I'm never going to get old. Mm -hmm. But the motivator for that son is I want to make this world a more just place. Mm -hmm. And so they are the ones who these these other motivations kick in for them in a big way. Mm -hmm. They are the environmentalists. They are the ones who are going to be animal advocates. It, all of these motivations really kick in. But Lee, there's one other motivation that I think in some ways is the most important of all. If your grandparents had diet-related diseases, if your parents did, if you do, and suddenly you've got this information about what actually caused that high cholesterol, mm -hmm. what caused the colorectal cancer, what caused the insulin resistance that's leading to diabetes. And with that knowledge, you can not only turn around your own health, but you can pack up this information Give it to your daughter, your son, their children. And that is a gift that will save their life. Mm -hmm. um, you can break away from, from diseases uh, being handed down from one generation after another. So the idea of having the next generation be healthier and happier and being able to stay together, um, happier than we ever could have been, healthier than we could have been, that is a huge motivator. And our patients are aware of that. They think, I'm glad I'm healthy, but mm -hmm. I've just got the best thing ever to give to my kids. Mm -hmm. Now, you're so fortunate at, at uh, the Barnard Medical Center. You have access to uh, dietitians that are versed in you know, plant-based nutrition. But why do mainstream dietitians promote a diet that limits healthy carbs and treats uh, to treat? They, they limit carbohydrates to, carbohydrates to treat diabetes. And I've had conversations with people that work in my own department that have diabetes, and they and I'll tell them that really, if you're eating healthy carbohydrates, you will actually improve your insulin sensitivity and your type two diabetes might even completely go away. And I'm just met with absolute incredulity. So why do dietitians promote this when the, the science is in your favor with what you advocate? Well, dietitians are like doctors in that they vary quite a lot. There are some doctors who have learned about how diet affects the body and they're, they're there are others who haven't, and the same is true with dietitians. There have been many schools of thought, and there are some whose education was kind of fossilized in the 1950s, where they got the idea that they should, that, that was sort of a normal, normal diet. And, and to their credit, they discovered that if you limit carbohydrate, your blood sugar won't rise as much as it would otherwise, or that kind of thing. Um, what they're missing is that all the science over the past two to three decades has shown that the cause of diabetes is not a high carbohydrate diet. Um, that never was the issue at all. That was kind of a, 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 side, of, a side issue. Um, once we learned about intramyocellular lipid and how to control it, um, and the fact that we could, could actually quantify it on magnetic resonance scanning, um, it just, I mean, it just changed our understanding of this disease. And and unfortunately, people really do need to, to catch up with, with what we're doing. Now, I, I should say one other thing. A lot of doctors are reluctant to refer to a dietitian. They'll see the patient, and the patient will go out the door without, without really a discussion about food at all. Mm -hmm. Now, you can understand that. They don't have a dietitian in the office. Okay, fair enough. But wait a minute. There are dietitians that you can refer to who may be across town, or they may be on your computer through telemedicine. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of them in every state in the United States who follow and understand and can prescribe a completely vegan diet. Seek out those dietitians, refer to them all the time, and your patients are going to be thrilled and they're going to know you're the best doctor in the world. And if doctors say, well, I don't know a dietitian, I don't care enough to, to find one, that's, in my view, indefensible. It's like if you're an orthopedic surgeon and you don't know how to refer for physical therapy, what are you talking about? You need to know the physical therapist who, who's going to help your patient. Um, or in the same way as, as if, if you're dealing with a patient who's got a, a severe depression and you can say, well, let nature take its course. No, uh -uh. you're going to find a therapist for that patient. Um, 
if the patient has diabetes, this was not caused by them eating rice. Um, this is caused by a bad diet. You've got to refer them to a competent practitioner um, to help them to get their diet in order. That's the cause of the disease. So um, anyway, luckily, they are there. At, at our center, the Barnard Medical Center, we have a perfect, perfectly terrific dietitian who works for us. But if a person in some other state wants to, through telemedicine, see our registered dietitian, they can. And we're more than happy uh, to do that. So the, the modern ways of communicating make really good treatment available to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I personally, I find it just unconscionable that, you know, people come through our hospital and they have no meaningful dietary counseling. And one of my sources of frustration, one of the reasons that why Joyce and I started this uh, website is, um, you know, I approached the administration about the hospital. And I said, we really should be addressing nutrition with patients since it's the cause of why they're here. And they actually really didn't have a lot of appetite for that. It was really quite frustrating. So, you know, um, I was hoping to work within the system to try to make changes and then decided that it's not very fertile ground for doing so and thought, well, we'll just make an end run around it and use modern technology and approach people through modern technology. So that's one of the incentives for this current website. But it's interesting, you talked about, you know, infiltration of the organs with fat. And I see that on CT scans all the time. You know, it's very common to see the liver. In fact, it's it's almost as many as one in three Americans have fatty infiltration of the liver now. And I feel like a broken record mentioning that in my ultrasound and CAT scan reports. You'll, we'll see, you'll see it in the pancreas, you'll see it in the product glands, and sometimes you can even visibly see it in the muscles. Um, so it fits in with what you're saying about insulin resistance. Um, but maybe... Um, Maybe, so it's the molecules of fat that create a, an inability for the insulin receptors to work. Does it matter if that fat is saturated fat or polyunsaturated fat or are those issues at all? Um, both can probably do it, but the saturated fat's probably worse. Um, let me mention a, a couple of lines of research. Back in the 1990s at Yale University, researchers brought in healthy volunteers. They were skinny, they were young, they didn't have diabetes. They hooked, uh, this is uh, Jerry Shulman and Kit Peterson and their team um, at Yale in the Department of Endocrinology. They, the volunteers had an IV put in, an in intravenous line, and they infused a, a lipid infusion. It's, it's basically just a fatty infusion that went into their vein, sort of the equivalent of eating a cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. And as the fat went into their veins, what they could see is that their insulin resistance, their, their muscle and liver cells, we're, we're, we're just not responding to, to insulin normally. Their insulin resistance started to increase, not over days and weeks, but just over minutes and hours. So in other words, you can take a person who is not insulin resistant at noon and make them insulin resistant at 4.30 the same day. Mm -hmm. They then did later studies, and Michael Roden's group in Germany did these studies as well, where instead of just an infusion, you could give these same fatty foods by mouth. And you can do it in one meal. Wow. Now, they studied palm oil, which is a very saturated fat, but they also studied canola oil, which is more monounsaturated. They'll both do it, um, although the, the more saturated ones are probably worse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, speaking of fats, um, an issue that comes up, you know, in, uh, you know, the websites about plant-based nutrition is, is there a need to supplement with omega-3 fats or is there not? Can we get adequate omega-3 fats through just plant-based eating or should is, is this something that we should supplement? Uh, great question. I don't think uh, I don't think the last word has been said on this. Um, you do need some fat in the diet. And there, there are two fats that are essential fats, alpha linolenic acid mm -hmm. and linoleic acid. No, people don't have to remember the, the, these names, mm -hmm. but alpha linolenic acid is a uh, an omega-3 that is in, in plants, and there's lots of it. Um, and if you're eating a lot of plants, you're getting the alpha linolenic acid that you need. Linoleic acid is even more widespread in plants. Um, however, if you're eating a lot of greasy stuff that can interfere with the proper metabolism of these healthy plant fats. Um, so some people will say, maybe I should uh, eat fish because it's got a, a longer chain um, uh, omega-3s in it. And, and that, that's true. It does have them. But the problem, a couple of problems with fish, um, you, you, let's say you go to the store and you get a salmon. Atlantic salmon is 40% fat. Mm -hmm. Chinook salmon is 50% fat or a little bit more. 
Um, and if you send it to a lab, they'll say, yeah, yeah, there's some omega-3 in there, but most of the fat is not omega-3. Mm -hmm. And the person eats it and they're gaining weight because they're eating basically a sponge filled with grease and they can't lose weight. But they say, but it's good fat, isn't it? And the laboratory would say, mostly not. It's There's saturated fat and other kinds. And there's some omega-3, but not much. Okay, so what do you do? There is a literature that says that people who are low in some of these omega-3s, DHA and EPA, might in fact be at higher risk for Alzheimer's. We, we don't have a lot of research to know one way or the other, but let's say that's true. And a person thinks, I want to make sure I've got the, the omega-3s I need, um, but I'm kind of worried about all this fish fat and so forth. If you look online um, or in the health food store, they'll have the omega-3 supplements, um, which are fish oil. Right next to them, they have the omega-3 supplements that are exactly the same that are plant-based and they're actually algae derived. Mm -hmm. And it's based on the theory that where did the fish get them? Mm -hmm. The fish got them from algae. So if the fish did that, why kill the fish and eat their fat and, and all the mercury and junk that's in them? Why not have the algal, al algal source directly? So if you go, forgive me for this long-winded way of, of addressing a, your great question. Um, if you wish to supplement omega-3, you will have no difficulty doing so. Um, look online, look up the e DHA and EPA supplements uh, that are from vegan sources. There's a wide variety of them and they're fine. Here's the reason I said that, that I don't think the last word has been written. Researchers have also found that people who have high levels of omega-3s in their blood have a higher risk of prostate cancer. And at first, when this came out, A, we thought it was just a fluke. But as time went on, it's been pretty, a pretty consistent finding. And we don't know, I, I don't have the mechanism for it. I, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. But it's made us think, gee, you know, maybe we shouldn't be driving the omega-3 so much. Nobody knows the answer. So one um, plausible solution is to, to test yourself. Mm -hmm. There are companies. Um, which I'm not necessarily recommending, but there's one called Omega Quant, and there are others where you go online and you pay them something like 50 bucks, and they'll send you a card, and you put a drop of blood on the card, mail it back, and they'll tell you, here's your DHA level. Are you high? Are you low? And if you're low, you can decide if you want to supplement, and if you supplement, you, you don't want the fish oil thing um, with all the contaminants that that has. Um, you want the, the plant-based one. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. Uh, it remains to be seen if 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 there's any real benefit to mm -hmm. pushing the omega threes. We had thought it would be heart healthy. Turns out that's probably not the case at all. Mm -hmm. um, the link with cancer came out of the blue. We weren't expecting it. Um, if there's a protection against Alzheimer's, that would be good to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of familiar with the same sort of information. I've gone back and forth on you know, whether or not to take an omega supplement. And when I have, I use the algae base, but perhaps, you know, may, I should do the test exactly as to describe. Um, now, speaking of supplements, are there any supplements that you recommend for people adopting a whole food plant-based vegan diet? Everybody should take vitamin B12. And frankly, that's regardless of diet. Uh, in people over 50, the U.S. government says you should be taking B12. You need it for healthy nerves and healthy blood cells. And uh, when people are over 50, they're not often making as much uh, stomach acid as they used to, which means that if there's B12 in meat or dairy or whatever, they, they're having more trouble separating it from the protein. Um, when a person is on a vegan diet, they're really not getting B12 except from the, for I mean, there's a lot of fortified foods that have B12 in it, but to be sure, you should really take B12. Uh, vitamin D is something that comes from the sun, but if you unfortunately don't live in a sunny latitude, or if you're in a spot where it happens to be cold in January and you're all bundled up, um, a lot of doctors would say, take vitamin D, 2000 international units a day, something like that. Um, those are the main ones, but uh, but there's only one supplement that I would really push everybody to have that's B12. Mm -hmm. D depends on whether you're getting sunlight. And then from there, there's people make a pitch for this or that supplement, kind of regardless of diet. Yeah, uh, you know, I've heard claims that you should take diet uh, supplemental zinc if you're on a plant-based diet, but my understanding is if you actually take in like enough seeds, you know, 
pumpkin seeds or whatever, you can get that. But Dr. T. Colin Campbell raised the issue that when you take a supplement, you're absorbing it in sort of this concentrated, isolated form. And we don't really know what the effect is going to be. Like, for example, if you, I'm sure you know that if you take dietary calcium, or sorry, supplemental calcium, it does decrease osteoporotic fractures, but actually increase calcification of blood vessels in the heart. So it's not the same as eating the food. It's just never the same to take a supplement as, as to eat the food. Um, oh, that, that's that's absolutely true. And for some things like vitamin E, for example, you can get go to the store, get a vitamin E supplement, but there are eight natural forms of vitamin E. They come in a certain balance when you, when you get them in an almond, but when you get them in a supplement, you're getting one form or two forms. The problem is if you get the supplemental form, that one or two forms of vitamin E that you're getting in the pill suppress your absorption of all the others from food. So you may be doing yourself more harm than good. If you can get it in food, that's good. That said, don't be a hero. For some people who say, well, I want, you know, in nature, I wouldn't have any need for a vitamin B12 supplementation. I don't want to take anything. I don't want to take B12. That's a mistake. You don't live in, in nature. Mm -hmm. You live in Wisconsin. <laughs> you live in New Jersey or wherever it may be. And so you do need to think about supplementing at least for B12. Yeah, B12 was an issue for me. It was like a major hang up for me to justify a plant-based diet. I, I thought, well, any diet where you have to take a supplement by definition is not a physiological diet. And who knows in what other ways it's you know bad for your health. And so that was a roadblock for me until I happened to hear uh, Dr. Gregor talking on YouTube and he mentioned basically that you would get in a natural world, you get enough B12 by drinking untreated water, picking your vegetables up off the ground and that sort of thing. And that opened my mind to looking at the whole thing. And then I started to explore it and then realized that this is a diet that makes the most sense of all. Um, now, what about, uh, do you have any thoughts on supplemental metformin for people that are not necessarily diabetic? Dr. David Sinclair, PhD from, I believe he's at Harvard. He's an, anti, uh, an aging researcher. He advocates uh, metformin uh, for longevity and potentially cancer protect, uh, prevention. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, no, I don't. Um, uh, I mean, there are people who are looking at pharmaceuticals that might uh, make your life even better than it is now, um, but I don't have any evidence on that myself. Okay. Now, just a few more questions. Um, you know, people know about type 1 diabetes that's, you know, caused usually as a child, it's an autoimmune reaction to the pancreatic cells. Type 2 diabetes is something that we tend to get as we get older through insulin resistance from what we eat. Uh, there's this entity called uh, type 1.5 diabetes. What's that all about? Yeah, well, type 1 diabetes means that the, the pancreas, the beta cells in the pancreas have been killed. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're not making uh, insulin anymore or virtually none. Um, and by the way, even there, a plant-based diet is a really good idea because even though it won't cause you to, to make more insulin, I mean, you're going to still need to administer insulin. Mm -hmm. The amount that you need is going to be minimized uh, when you're on a plant-based diet because your own insulin, your own cells are much more insulin sensitive. So we recommend a low-fat vegan diet for everybody, including people with type 1 diabetes. Type 1.5 um, is really viewed as sort of the type 1 diabetes that arrive kind of late in your life. You know, you're an adult and, and you know, it, it seems like you've got type 2. What's the deal? Uh, but uh, it, it looks like there may be a, a more rapid drop off of beta cell function for you than other people. So stay tuned. There's more research uh, that's needed on here. But bottom line, the, the diet changes are still the same. Uh, the question is whether you may need uh, medications or even insulin um, as time goes on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I find this is this is all so fascinating. I find the science behind it all really fascinating. And, you know, the way it interfaces with the uh, state of the current healthcare system. But um, uh, maybe we should wrap it up there. You're you're busy and I'm busy. Um, any final thoughts? How how do people uh, learn about your organization and um, and uh, uh, how to change their diet from your point of view? Well, thank you for asking that. Um, my my most recent book is called Your Body in Balance: The New Science of Food hormones and health. And it's all about how you can control the hormones in your body, which is a mind blowing thought. Insulin is a hormone, estradiol, testosterone, thyroid hormone. We can dial them up and down based on what we eat. And uh, it's an amazing thing. So I hope people will pick up your body in balance and share it with other people. Our website is PCRM, 
PCRM.org. That stands for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM.org. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Barnard. Hopefully you can do this again sometime. I look forward to it. Thank you so much and all the best for the great work that you're doing. Okay, thanks. Thank you.